Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for thank you all for joining us for the 22nd edition of the World Sustainable De Development Summit, India's premier platform for deliberating the discourse around sustainability and climate change. My name is Smita Chakravarti. I'm a research associate here at Terry, and I will be emceeing today's proceedings. Before we commence the function today, a brief safety announcement during the event here at Stein Auditorium. Terry is a health, safety, and environment certified organization. In case of any untoward incident, like the fire evacuation is needed, you're required to exit from this auditorium through the fire exit gate nearest to you without any panic. There are seven exit gates for this auditorium, four in the ground floor, right, left, and two main entrances. There is one exit in the stage and two exits in the balcony, which are the entrances to the balcony. In case of fire, fire marshals will take position in the aisles and exit gates to help you evacuate. The session is on promoting diversity and inclusion for a greener future. The session will be chaired by Ms. Dipali Khanna, Vice President, the Rockefeller Foundation. We are happy to have a very distinguished line of speakers who need no introduction. On our panel, we have Her Excellency, Ms. Niyal Kaba, Minister of Planning and Development, Republic of Cote d'Ivory. Her Excellency, Ms. Emma Theophilus, Honorable Dep uh, Deputy Minister of Information, Communication and Technology, Namibia. Keynote addresses by Dr. Swami, uh, Soumya Swaminathan, former Chief Scientist, World Health Organization. And special addresses by Ms. Ridhima Yadav, Board Director of the Institute of Women, Peace and Security. And Professor Pratik Sharma, Vice Chancellor, Terry School of Advanced Studies. I now invite Ms. Dipali Khanna, the Rockefeller Foundation, to conduct the proceedings of the session. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. I'm here today to discuss an important topic that is very, very close to my heart and is crucial to building a greener future for us all, promoting diversity and inclusion. It is no secret that our world is facing significant environmental challenges from climate change to resource depletion. To overcome these challenges, we must work together and we must do so in a way that celebrates our differences. Diversity and inclusion are essential to building a greener future for several reasons. First, our planet is home to a vast array of different cultures, traditions, and perspectives. By including all of these voices in our efforts to protect the environment, we can ensure that our solutions are relevant, effective, and sustainable. We need to recognize that everyone, regardless of their background or identity, has a unique perspective that can contribute to the development of effective strategies to uh, mitigate the environmental crisis that we're all facing. Second, promoting diversity and inclusion is essential for creating a more just and equitable world. The environmental crisis affects different communities in different ways, and marginalized communities often bear the brunt of the impact. We must recognize the disproportionate impact of environmental degradation on marginalized communities and work to create more equitable and inclusive solutions that address the needs of all people. Promoting diversity and inclusion in our efforts to create a greener future can help us to build a stronger and more resilient society, which is really the need of the hour. By bringing together people from diverse backgrounds, we can build bridges across diverse across divides, promote understanding, and foster a sense of shared purpose. Working together, we can develop innovative solutions, build stronger communities, and create a better world for us all. Women leaders are critical levers in making this a reality. I just want to have a raise in hands if, how many people agree with that statement that I just made? Women leaders are critical uh, levers in making this a reality. Okay, I just see a very few. Okay, maybe I should ask who disagrees with the statement. Ambassador Puri, you don't disagree, right? <laughs> so women are the most um, impacted and negatively around the global catastrophes, making their role as leaders even more important. Historically and statistically, according to UNDP, when disaster strikes, women and children are 14 times more likely than men to die. 14 more times. Women are drastically impacted during global catastrophes. Studies also, sh also show that women are adversely affected due to climate change. 
Women's uh, vulnerability to climate change stems from a number of socioeconomic and cultural factors. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Gujarat spending time with the salt pan workers. It was really sad to see the situation where women had to go out and do work at fought Fifth, close to 50 degrees temperature rise and you know they're being impacted the most but are they being involved in any decision that's happening either within their own families their communities uh, there's a lot that needs to be done over there and it was kind of quite sad to see the plight women constitute the majority of the world's poor and are disproportionately dependent on depleted natural resources men and women differ in their roles responsibilities decision making access to land and natural resources, opportunities and needs, all of which are shared by both sexes. The plethora of viewpoints, life experiences and techniques that women bring to participatory policy making for climate action makes their involvement and role even more crucial. One of the major misconceptions in the gender and climate dialogue though has been to either elevate or demean women, treating them as uh, um, merely victims the complexities and distinctiveness of gendered experiences which occur even within the feminine identity may frequently become lost in their duality. The only way to change these structural patterns is to seek to establish new ones in which women are structurally represented in all levels of decision making. We really need to be ensuring we're creating an enabling environment for women to be empowered. Nobody can empower women, but we really need to create that environment. Enabling opportunities for women from disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities and bringing more voices to the foreground is absolutely essential and critical. The developing world is the most impacted in global catastrophes, more so the women in these regions. Emerging economies represent 85% of the world's population and are facing the biggest social and environmental challenges. Yet, they are often underrepresented in the global discourse about reviving and reshaping the post-pandemic world. It has been noted that the global South voices are not heard enough as developed economies still have louder voices, even in issues that primarily impact the global South, leave alone getting women there. We need to enable opportunities for women from the global South and disadvantaged communities and be able to really help them amplify their voices, their challenges and their lived experiences that are very unique to their social cultural, political, economic, and development realities. We need to just, not just empower their voices, but also give women from the Global South opportunities and positions to lead and empower other women. Women's leadership is particularly critical to deliver SDGs and to make opportunities universal and sustainable for all. We need to ensure that women from the Global South have the chance to lead. I was very encouraged when Vibha, you were able to get the president of COP28 um, to the Terry, for a Terry Roundtable, and he really made a shout out for the Global South. I wish we can also get women into that Global South because you, know, you just don't want to see men from the Global South uh, representing women. So we do have an opportunity to push some boundaries. There are, of course, challenges that women face. It is not all that simple as women and gender minorities continue to face barriers to achieving leadership positions because of gender discrimination and social stereotypes. The consequences of such prejudiced leadership that limits women's empowerment are cause for both concern and a reason for us to do something about it. Women from the Global South face greater challenges in gaining or retaining power Leadership development opportunities are scarce and unavailable or inaccessible. Furthermore, the path to leadership is rarely shared and the challenges are steep, rife with patriarchy, hierarchy and bias. There may also be a lack of female support systems such as peers, coaches, mentors, role models, champions and other structures. I'm really delighted, of course, we have Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who's really a role model for many of us, who's been at the helm of affairs, and we hope you'll continue in your new role to continue to inspire many young people. And also we have Ridhima, who as uh, somebody who's very passionate, and again, we need to be giving young women more of an opportunity to be able to be part of the conversations, unlike people like myself who are speaking on behalf of Ridhima. So we're so excited, Ridhima, you're here with us as well. We need to build women-led communities to shape a sustainable and inclusive future for all. 
We need more women to be in the boardroom, at the table, with a microphone, and given the opportunity to speak and be addressed by their title. It's not that we just need to be seen, we need to be heard. Platforms like G20, G7, and COP need to not just talk about gender, but also enable women and other gender minorities to lead the discourse. A sustainable and inclusive future for all where no one is left behind is going to be really important. When women walk the talk, lead the talk, and do the walk, can we hope for a tomorrow where gender equality is a reality? And I hope all of you agree with me. We need to reshape the conversations and reimagine institutional governance around climate change by putting women at the center of all these conversations. I'm a deep believer in communities. I have immense faith in the power they yield. At the Rockefeller Foundation, through the Asia Impact Leaders Network, which we seeded through the Asia Venture Philanthropy Network, I've seen where a collective can offer to maximize potential and impact of the cause. Women-led communities like SEVA, too, have shown me how powerful it is when women lead the show. As I mentioned, I was recently with SEVA in the run of Kutch, and we, have, we are working with them. We announced with Secretary Clinton the $50 million Global Climate Resilience Fund, where women will be able to really combat the climate changes, and we're really talking about the vulnerable, marginalized women in um, professions such as the salt pan work that they do, or in the dump yards where they're uh, separating garbage, again, at temperatures soaring, as we all know. Um, so I'm really um, looking forward to hearing from my esteemed speakers here today as they throw sh uh, some more light on how we can incorporate diversity and inclusivity in building a greener, cleaner, and more habitable future. Our journeys should set the stage for people from different backgrounds to take the leap to challenge the status quo, set higher benchmarks, and break glass ceilings. And I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'll now turn over to introduce um, the Minister of Planning and Development. OK. So we have um, um, Ms. Niala Kaba, Minister of Planning and Development, Government of Cote d'Ivoire. OK, sorry. Um, so uh, we have Ms. Elba Rose. Uh, Montoya, Minister of Science, Technology, and Environment, Republic of Cuba, who needs no introduction. So we're going to get a video recording from her. Can we have the video message, please? Distinguidos participantes y organizadores de la Cumbre Mundial de Desarrollo Sostenible, agradezco la invitación a participar en este evento y permitirnos compartir nuestras consideraciones sobre los pilares del Pacto de Desarrollo Verde promovido por el Gobierno de la India, que están muy interconectados y son muy oportunos. Avanzar en estos cinco pilares requiere de una intensa cooperación internacional. Los países del sur debemos estar unidos en modelos de cooperación que vayan más allá de las vías tradicionales, que permitan promover modos de vida respetuosos y amigables con el medio ambiente. Es también necesario un compromiso redoblado de los responsables históricos con la degradación del planeta. El modelo de desarrollo insostenible de los países desarrollados incubó el cambio climático y otros problemas globales que nos aquejan, mientras que países como Cuba sufren ahora esos efectos sin haber prácticamente contribuido a sus causas. Sobre los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, destacamos que constituye el compromiso más integrador de la comunidad internacional en el marco de dar atención a importantes metas e indicadores tanto sociales como económicos y medioambientales, en un contexto mundial caracterizado por una triple crisis ambiental, que son el cambio climático, la pérdida de la diversidad biológica y la contaminación del medio ambiente. Asimismo, en muchos países se mantienen como problemas críticos la seguridad alimentaria, el acceso al agua potable, a servicios de salud y educación. La pobreza extrema aumentó un 1% en el 2021 según el Banco Mundial. Todos estos problemas deberían tener solución con la implementación de los ODS. Sin embargo, a casi 10 años de su adopción, los resultados son discretos y más bien pudieran ocurrir que los limitados progresos alcanzados se reviertan como resultado de que habitamos un mundo post pandémico con una expandida crisis económica e inflacionaria global. 
Para lograr avances en los ODS es esencial un mayor empleo y acceso al conocimiento, la ciencia y la innovación. Al respecto, la Organización de Estados Iberoamericanos analizó el comportamiento de la producción científica sobre los ODS e identificó que hasta el 2019 el mayor aporte se realizó en energía asequible y no contaminante, acción por el clima y ciudades y comunidades sostenibles. Sin embargo, ha habido muy poca contribución en el ODS-1 sobre la pobreza. Los países en desarrollo requieren acceso a tecnologías para cambiar patrones insostenibles de producción y consumo. La implementación de modelos de economía circular pudieran contribuir en este cambio de patrones, pero también se necesitan alianzas que apoyen el desarrollo de la circularidad. Uno de los mayores retos está en aumentar el valor agregado de los productos recuperados y priorizar el aprovechamiento del potencial de todos los residuos con interés creciente en los plásticos. Para avanzar en la transición energética y el financiamiento climático necesitamos una gobernanza y ética climática abierta, basada en la solidaridad y justicia financiera, así como en el principio de las responsabilidades comunes pero diferenciadas y respectivas capacidades. La solidaridad climática es dejar de actuar por intereses económicos individuales, es pensar en los que pierden condiciones de vida, es ayudar a los más vulnerables. La justicia financiera es disponer de nuevos y adicionales fondos para resarcir las pérdidas y daños e implementar las medidas de adaptación que necesitamos, simplificar procedimientos y acordar una nueva meta financiera. Se requiere componer una arquitectura medioambiental global más sólida, donde integremos elementos que hoy están dispersos. Por ejemplo, hay que integrar el proceso de implementación del Acuerdo de París con los resultados de la reciente conferencia del Convenio sobre la Diversidad Biológica. En esta integración hay que incorporar conceptos relevantes como el de una salud y las negociaciones en curso sobre plásticos. Solo para realzar algunos ejemplos que hoy a nuestro juicio no tienen suficiente integración desde las perspectivas de los países del sur. Señoras y señores, Cuba enfrenta un recrudecido bloqueo económico, comercial y financiero impuesto por los Estados Unidos. No obstante, hemos aprobado un grupo de políticas públicas enfocadas al desarrollo sostenible. Por tal razón, deseo expresar el ofrecimiento y disposición de mi país para compartir la modesta experiencia alcanzada en el enfrentamiento al cambio climático, en especial a través de la gestión sostenible y restauración de ecosistemas marino costeros y terrestres, como los arrecifes de coral, playas y manglares, la aplicación de la ciencia para identificar los impactos actuales y futuros del cambio climático y el establecimiento de las políticas nacionales para la eliminación paulatina de focos y fuentes contaminantes del medio ambiente. Para mi país, actual presidente del Grupo G77 Más China en Nueva York, constituye una prioridad trasladar sin descanso, de manera flexible y siempre constructiva, para llevar a la práctica la visión transformadora que defiende el grupo e impulsar mediante acciones reales las aspiraciones recogidas en la Agenda 2030. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Your Excellency Alba Montoya, for your um, kind words. And I think, you know, with you being in the helm of affairs, there's a lot of hope and optimism. I'll now turn over to Ms. Niala Kaba, Minister for Planning and Development, Go Government of Kodivar. According to the President of the Republic of Kodivar, His Excellency Mr. Alasan Katara, Ms. Niala Kaba is the first class economist, and that coming from the President does mean a lot. Ms. Kaba is an economist, statistician, engineer, graduated from NSA Paris. She also holds a postgraduate degree in international economics and development economics, and a degree in economic policy management from the IMF Institute. She, starts, she started her career in 1989 in education and quickly joined the administration where she held senior positions from 1995 to 2007, such as Chief of Staff at the Prime Minister's Office, Deputy Director of Cabinet at the Ministry of Economy and Finance, Director of Cabinet at the Ministry in Charge of Crafts and the Informal Sector, and Director General of Codivar Tourism. 
Since 2011, she has served in ministerial positions, Minister for the Promotion of Housing, Minister in Charge of Economy and Finance, and Minister of Planning and Development since 2016. So we'll have a video message. Excellence, Madame les Ministres, Madame la Présidente de Sion. Your Excellencies, Ministers, Madam Chairwoman, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'd like at the outset to thank the Energy and Resources Institute for giving me this opportunity to contribute to the brain work on the theme, Promoting Diversity and Inclusion for a Greener Future, today, February 24th, 2023, during the Women's Leadership Plenary Session. This worldwide renowned summit is definitely an appropriate platform to reflect together on the ways and means to improve the inclusion of women in decision-making processes. Distinguished delegates, Cote d'Ivoire is aware of the obstacles to the full participation of women in the political, economic, and social life of the country. Therefore, the principle of equality between men and women was enshrined in the 2016 Constitution. Various texts spell out women's rights, including the 2019 law requiring a minimum quota of 30% of women on political parties' candidates' lists. In addition, our country ratified ILO C-100, Equal Remuneration Convention, which enshrines equal remuneration for men and women for work of equal value. However, women currently represent only 23% of members of the government, 13% of those elected to parliament, and 7.5% of municipal elected officials. This situation could be explained by cultural resistance to female leadership, institutional mindsets, individual mindsets, and life choices. These mindsets explain the reluctance of political actors to favor or encourage women participation on electoral lists. On the other hand, the violence in political debates and all the social implications which an involvement in politics entails are barriers to women's engagement. We see that in the case of my country, a systemic approach must prevail. However, in order for regulatory aspects, i.e. reforms and decisions in favor of women's leadership and empowerment to be effective, the approach must include the establishment of mechanisms and means whereby their effective implementation is assured. As examples, we can mention firstly the changes in the work environment and working conditions to accommodate women according to their needs, and secondly the repression by regulatory means of verbal and physical violence against women in politics. Distinguished panelists, to the question of how are women leaders using their positions to question the status quo and bringing more voices from the ground to the forefront, I would answer that we can make significant changes in people's lives by intervening mainly at two levels. First, by striving to be role models in the performance of our duties. This includes seeking excellence in the work, but also carrying out issues that are likely to speed up mainstreaming women's voices and rights in public policies. Secondly, as a local elected representative, by developing a close relationship with the female population to make sure that they fully benefit from all initiatives dedicated to their well-being through the establishment of appropriate listening channels, information and awareness raising mechanisms, establishment and support of well-developed initiatives for women's empowerment. In regard to climate, as you know, in most developing countries, my country included, women are not only more vulnerable to climate change, but they are also effective actors or agents of change in relation to both mitigation and adaptation. Cote d'Ivoire has therefore rightly developed and is implementing its national strategy for gender and climate change over the period 2020-2024. In this regard, a platform has been created bringing together two ministries in charge of environment and of women and our technical and financial partners in order to take gender into account in a systematic way in studies, data collection, and field actions. I cannot finish my speech without stressing the importance of education and training of girls. Because it is by having a large pool of educated, well-trained women aware of their rights and their ability to fully contribute to the development of their country that strategies for social advancement of women to management positions can be achieved more easily and successfully. I thank you for your attention.
I wish you all a productive and successful meeting. Thank you, Your Excellency, Ms. Niara Kaba, for those inspirational words. And I think everything that you said really touched on everything that I think in the audience and I personally feel needs, need, is the need of the hour. How do we really get women leaders to be part of the change that we want to see when it comes to the climate discourse? Um, I'll now turn over to uh, Emma Theophilus, Deputy Minister for Information, Communication, and Technology, Government of Namibia. Emma Theophilus is a Nam Namibian politician currently serving as Deputy Minister of Information, Communication and Technology. She's a former youth activist, so I'm really excited about listening to her. Having served as Deputy Speaker of the Children's Parliament from 2013 to 2018, she started her career after she completed a law degree at the University of Namibia as Legal Officer in the Ministry of Justice. Can we have a video message, please? Greetings from Windhoek, Namibia. I am pleased to have been invited to speak at this year's Delhi Sustainable Development Summit and more specifically about women leadership. The umbrella theme of the summit, mainstreaming sustainable development and climate resilience for collective action is quite befitting. Many of you might be wondering why I look relatively young to be a member of parliament and the Deputy Minister of Information and Communication Technology in the Republic of Namibia. Well, it was no coincidence. Specific and intentional actions were taken to mainstream women into leadership in Namibia. First, the ruling party, the Swapo Party of Namibia, adopted a few years ago a zebra-style policy that ensured that 50% of all party representatives to parliament would be made up of women. Secondly, it's simply just political will. His Excellency Dr. Hage J. Genkop, the President of the Republic of Namibia, showed leadership in his commitment to trust women with leadership in his country. He appointed our first female and current Prime Minister, appointed the most number of female ministers we have to date since our independence in 1990, and of course, myself, a 23-year-old Member of Parliament and Deputy Minister in his government. Therefore, women leadership needs allies, men and women in leadership already, that are willing to trust women to take the lead in the most senior of positions. The same can be said for the private sector. The financial sector, as we all know, is quite huge in almost every economy. And in Namibia, 80% of all the CEOs of the major banks are female. Therefore, although a young democracy, Namibia is quite exemplary in empowering girls and women alike to pursue public and private leadership. What has been my experience so far? Well, it has been a very interesting journey. And if there is one thing I know as I speak to you today, it is that in order to mainstream some sustainable development and climate resilience for collective action, we need more women leaders. I wish you all a successful 22nd edition of the Delhi Sustainable Development Summit, and I thank you for your kind attention. Wow, Your Excellency Emma Theophilus, I wish we could learn from Namibia, being a young democracy, what you've been able to do and the kind of opportunities you're creating for young women. I think here in India and across Asia, there's a lot, there's a lot we can learn. I think what you said was just so powerful, having women as allies. We need men and women to really be working together. And I'm glad that Pratik is here with us on the panel because, you know, we already know why women's leadership is important, but we need more Pratiks, we need more men to be speaking and really ensuring that you know, women have that environment for them to be able to really not only survive, but thrive and prosper. So thank you. Uh, I'll now turn over to Dr. Swamya Swaminathan, who's the chairperson for MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. 
Um, Samia, I must admit, I'm a great, great fan of yours, and you've been such a role model, honestly, to all of us, you know, and the role that you've played more, most recently as the chief scientist at WHO, Deputy Director General for Programs. I know any time we asked Samia to speak at any uh, event, you know, whether it was the middle of the night or it was early hours, Samia, you've always made yourself available. So thank you so much. It really means a lot. A pediatrician from India and a globally recognized researcher on tuberculosis and HIV. She has 30 years of experience in clinical care and research, working throughout her career to translate <coughs> research into impactful programs. Dr. Swami Nathan was Secretary of the Government of India for Health Research and Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research from 2015 to 2017, and focused on bringing science and evidence into health policy making, building research capacity in Indian medical schools, and also forging South-South partnerships in health sciences. From 2009 to 2011, she served as coordinator of the UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO, Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases, Geneva. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Swaminathan. Over to you. Thank you very much for that <coughs> kind introduction, Dipali. And thank you, Vibha and Terry, for this uh, putting together this really energizing conversation. And this session in particular, I think we've already heard from previous speakers um, some of the key reasons why um, women not only need to be at the table, but actually need to be driving um, some of this change. Uh, what I would like to do, uh, because I've spent the last three years steeped in COVID and the COVID response, is really to try and find some analogies between the pandemic and what we experienced and um, the issues of climate change, climate risk, climate vulnerability, and also adaptation and, and solutions. And I think, to me, there are many areas where we can actually learn lessons. Let's start with the issue of a pandemic. Uh, it's a global threat. Um, COVID, as well as previous pandemics and future pandemics, we don't know when the next pandemic will strike. All we know is that there will be another one. And the reasons that are going to drive emergence of new pathogens, especially zoonotic pathogens, jumping from animal species to human species, you must have heard about the H5N1 that's making worrying species jumps now from birds into mammals. Um, these are the kind of things which are likely to happen more and more in the future because of habitat, biodiversity loss, closer uh, uh, mixing between humans and animals, but also with the changing climate um, vectors uh, and, and others also uh, perhaps showing up in places which they did not inhabit in the past. And we know now today that in 36 hours, a virus emerging in one part of the world, even in a remote rural community, can get to the opposite side of the world. That's how long it's estimated it will take. So it's going to be very difficult to stop the emergence, but there are lots of things we can do to prevent something like the COVID pandemic from becoming a, a global disaster again. Similarly, climate change. There are things that are happening. We have to try and reverse some of the things, uh, but at the same time, we have to think about adaptation, resilience, and learning how to live in a world that is going to be different from what it was 50 or even 20 years ago. For me, climate change is an immediate uh, threat to health. And I think we need to start thinking about uh, that in, in much more practical terms. I think air pollution has been mentioned a couple of times. The drivers of air pollution are the same as the drivers of climate change. Air pollution kills is estimated to kill about 7 million people a year, every, every year, every year. Um, and mostly in developing um, countries, you know, impacts on all organ systems. But apart from that, of course, we have the direct effects like heat stress, we have the changing vector ecology. So vector-borne diseases are likely to <clears throat> expand and spread into new areas. Water-borne diseases, we seen, we've seen last year more cholera outbreaks around the world than we saw uh, over the last few decades, clearly linked to climate and its, its effects, um, including things like migration and people moving away from homes and moving away from places where they have safe access to water and sanitation. 
and of course all of the effects on food insecurity. So, so all of that we, we know. What, what's, what are the other similarities? I think when we think about who was impacted in the pandemic, yes, the whole world was impacted, but who suffered the most? It was uh, low and middle, low income countries compared to higher income countries, and it was the poorer people in any country. So even if you look at very high income countries whom, uh, and you look at the impact on mortality, you'll see that people in the lowest quintile of wealth or uh, immigrants and uh, ethnic minorities or racial minorities in countries suffered disproportionately higher mortality as well as case rates compared to people who were, who were better off. And similarly, if you look at the impacts on food insecurity or livelihoods or poverty, um, it, it occurred much more in the low income countries and also on the impacts on other health services. Even though the direct deaths due to COVID may have been less because of the age profile of these countries, like in Africa, the median age is 18 years, and we know that COVID deaths occurred mostly in older age groups. But the impact on people because of disruption of health services meant more deaths due to malaria, tuberculosis, cancer, uh, and so on. So underlying uh, pre-existing non-communicable diseases was an individual risk factor for severe uh, COVID. Similarly, for climate effects, we know the elderly pregnant women and children, these are risk factors. At the community level, we've just talked about the risk factors. People who had poor access to healthcare suffered more in the pandemic. Similarly, people who have poor access to solutions, to adaptation, to technologies, uh, and who don't have alternate, uh, alternate livelihoods uh, suffer more due to climate. Then we have to talk about equity, and there's a lot of talk about equity now. But again, we saw the inequity in access, particularly vaccines, but also to diagnostics and drugs during, again, it's, it was between countries, mostly the inequities occurred mostly between countries, not so much between populations within countries, though vaccine hesitancy did drive some of those, the, those differences, um, which was not because of lack of supply, but because of beliefs. Similarly, I think here you have a lot of inequities being seen in, adapt in, again, access to technology, access to resources, funding, um, and uh, the cause for that in COVID was the lack of distributed manufacturing. And so that's, uh, we realized that parts of the world which did not have their own capacity to manufacture products, whether it was vaccines or drugs, were the last in the queue, waiting either for donations or for all countries to serve their own needs before you know, being able to spare. Similarly, I think here we, we have to think about innovations and we need a focus on distributed innovation. So it, in fact, very often it's people in the community, people on the ground who can actually find the solution. So should, we shouldn't be waiting for the solution to come from elsewhere, but this concept of distributed innovation to me is very similar to what we are now promoting as distributed manufacturing and technology transfer. So when I was at the WHO, we started a program on mRNA technology transfer, which means that people in any country in the world who want that technology should have access to it. It should not be in the hands of a few big private uh, companies. And now it's uh, a network of 16 countries actually working on mRNA, uh, all driven um, from scientists, open source, open technology, and sharing of knowledge. This needs to happen here as well. We need open uh, access to data and knowledge. And I think I want to mention the previous panel went into it in a lot of detail, but communication, particularly scientific communication, science literacy, and community engagement in the process of change is, uh, is extremely important. And there was a lot of misinformation during COVID, uh, but unfortunately that's spilling over into other areas of science. And so that can be very harmful. On Coming to solutions, we used to use the, the terms science, solutions, and solidarity. I think that you must have heard the Director General of WHO say that quite often, saying science will come with the solutions, but we need the solidarity globally to be able to make sure everybody has, has access to it. And that's, of course, the heart of the SDGs. So we need to look at, uh, at we need to look at partnerships and collaboration at the global level and regional level, but very, very much at the national level. And so I would like to make a plea really for us to work together, all agencies, organizations, and individuals 
whether we come from the science side or, or, or community-based NGOs or activists or media uh, for, for that matter, or people who, who have solutions uh, in the energy or water space or in the health, for example. I was recently in Odisha last week, and the biggest problem really articulated by the women in the village was water. And for many months of the year, they don't have reliable access to, to safe water. So this affects not only drinking and cooking, but it impacts um, agriculture, of course, but also things like sanitation, because the bath toilets that have been built cannot be used without any water availability. So it's, it's really a very important challenge and women's personal hygiene and issues like that are often neglected. Uh, but when you go and sit in the community, you can actually find out what the real priorities are. And again, we can have, we have lots of technological solutions today. I think there's no dearth of innovation happening, especially in India. It's just connecting those innovations to the needs on the ground. And of course, they need to be affordable. They need to be sustainable and they need to be eco-friendly. Um, it has, so solutions very often have to come bottom up. And one thing I always strikes me is that when we talk about vulnerabilities, uh, it's intersectionality always uh, that we have to keep in mind. It's not just being a woman that makes you more vulnerable, but being a woman who's also poor, who's also disenfranchised, who's also um, does not have, is illiterate or does not have access to knowledge and resources, all of these, and sometimes caste, religion, these things could also. So this is the intersectionality issue becomes extremely important. And we need to, when we talk about equity, I think those people are the ones who would be most impacted. But they're also the people who will help us to find the solutions. And I've seen when women get together, they get organized, they form self-help groups, and they are empowered. Their agency increases, and, and they can really um, improve not only their own situation, but through them, the situation, of course, of the family and the, and the children improve uh, as well. So I would like to close again by highlighting that I think if we can think about the health impacts of climate, it makes action, uh, it makes things actionable, it makes things practical, and it will also appeal to a people because we are talking about heat, all, everyone suffers from heat, but of course people who are uh, daily wage laborers and working out will suffer the most. But if there is a prolonged heat wave, then lots of people are going to get sick. So what are we going to do with our urban systems to prepare for that, mitigate as much as possible, but adapt as well? Similarly, we need to think about housing, we need to think about uh, livelihoods, but also conservation and, uh, and restoration. And these are the things that will build resilience. So health, as we talk about health system resilience, it's the health workers ultimately. You know, it's, yes, it's the infrastructure and the buildings, but if we don't empower our health workers, by the way, the majority of whom are female, and I met with a number of Anganwadi workers, Asha's, A&M's last week again in Odisha, these people actually need much more support than they get at the moment, considering the amount of responsibility that rests on their shoulders. So again, we see the same syndrome of majority of workforce being female, leadership often not being female, and therefore policy uh, being driven, which is not women friendly. And a very simple example is access to toilets for these health workers. You know, they, they come to meetings, sometimes they're called to spend the whole day, nobody's thought that they would need access to a toilet, you know, for those eight or nine hours that they're there. So these are the kind of things the first thing I ask, actually, when I go into the field is things like this, but maybe, they may, maybe the men don't ask or they may not even open out to, to a man. And therefore, they need not only mentorship and support, but we need to listen to, to them, learn from them, and, the, and also provide them leadership skills and training. Because these people should not spend the rest of their lives as a and &M and ASHA. Why can they not r rise up, you know, to take leadership positions within the health system? And so we need training and skilling. I was talking to Vibha earlier. There's a whole host of new job opportunities now with the changes in energy and you know, things like that. Solar, we need engineers, we need technicians who will repair these, these uh, devices that are going to be soon proliferating. So there are a host of opportunities on the digital side as well. Uh, so obviously skilling is going to be a big need. And finally, the governance, I think was also mentioned earlier, needs to be inclusive and we need 
uh, women uh, and disadvantaged communities at the table. We shouldn't be talking about them, at them. We should really be including them in, in finding uh, the solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Samia. And I think, you know, as you were speaking, I also want to share with the audience, we at the Rockefeller Foundation are going through our own climate learning journey to really see what we as a foundation can be doing going forward. And all that you said resonated because for us, you know, we really want to be seeing how with our climate change work, we are going to be putting people in the center. And when I'm talking about people, you know, our mission has always been to serve the well-being of humanity where we are always looking at vulnerable populations. So how do we really start with people and places? And again, as you said, the intersectionality of, you know, what we're doing in health and how climate is impacting everything we're trying to do on the health side or in our regenerative agriculture, how is climate affecting the work that we're trying to do similarly around the work that we've done around mitigation and the energy access agenda, how do we look at it uh, on the adaptation side. So I think the whole intersectionality becomes really important. Also in terms of just the statistics that we've all been hearing by 2050, 50 million people are going to be migrating on account of climate issues, you know, just in a place like Bangladesh, 20 million climate migrants is what we're hearing. And we know cities like Dhaka, I'm, I'm sure the case is not different here in India as well. Can you imagine? more and more people coming to tier one cities, what is it going to um, do in terms of all the development efforts that are being made. So I think for all of us, if we want to take away something is to really start thinking hard around the intersectionality. We have a wonderful opportunity with G20 where under India's presidency, this is what, you know, whether it's a life program that the prime minister has announced. I mean, there's so much more that can be done. And I think it's not about action that needs to be taken by somebody out there. What can we do at an individual level? What can we do at a community level? And how can we then kind of really collaborate with government to bring about the change? Because I think all governments today really are looking for innovative solutions to address this problem. They're equally concerned what is really needed as scalable models that we can take. And of course, the last thing I'll say is COP28 for the first time, we have a health track. So, you know, in all the conversations around climate, we will be able to have this opportunity to really share what we are learning when, it, when we look at climate and health more um, uh, from an intersectional uh, lens as opposed to looking at it vertically. I mean, just for me, it was quite shocking to hear, like, in a place like Masuri, there are dengue cases that are appearing. In a place like Cox Bazar, you know, in Bangladesh, you've not, you haven't had dengue from 2017 till 2021, and suddenly there's a rise in 2022. So they are warning signals. Are people making the connections? Am I making the connection? Are we making the connection of climate change and how it's impacting health? I, I think now I'll turn over to... Um, Ridhima Yadav, who's a non-resident fellow, board director at the Aspen Institute, George in, uh, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. Ridhima is a leader in sustainability and climate strategy with tri-sector experience in the public, private, and NGO sector. She's most recently been part of the Sustainable Investing Group at Goldman Sachs, prior to which she was founding team member of the Sustainable Finance Group in the executive office partnering with Goldman Sachs Global Businesses to deliver sustainability-related solutions for clients, climate, uh, for clients and stakeholders and designing group-level strategy, including a target to deploy not 750 million, but 750 billion in sustainable finance by 2030. Wow, Ridhima. Uh, Ridhima has advised hundreds of corporations, asset managers, and asset owners globally on climate finance, ESG, and sustainability. Prior to Goldman Sachs, she was named inaugural climate fellow for Secretary John Kerry and worked for the United Nations on trade and climate policy. She holds a BA in ethics, politics, and economics from Yale University and sits on the board of the We Are Family Foundation. Thank you, Ridhima, for joining us. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dipali, for that uh, wonderful introduction, and more so to uh, Dr. Vipha and the Terry team for having me uh, join this uh, incredible conference. Uh, there have been some wonderful speakers, so thank you also to my esteemed panelists who went ahead of me and also on this panel for being leaders uh, on climate and sustainability. Uh, I'm going to keep it very short, but focus on three things that are really important to me that I have, from my perspective, 
experienced and seen uh, as a person who has been involved in the climate space since I was a child uh, across many different industries and, and many different sectors and many different parts of the world. First, representation. Second, the role of the private sector. And third, because I'm a climate finance practitioner, the importance of the economic and financial case for driving more inclusive approaches to creating a low carbon economy for this climate transition that's going to affect us all, no matter who we are or where we are or what we do. Representation, firstly. I'm going to share a small anecdote. Eight years ago, uh, I was in Paris for uh, COP21. And I remember uh, at that point uh, as a student going there and seeing that leader's photo. I don't know if you all have, uh, have seen that, but every year COP uh, takes a photo of all the world leaders standing together with the UNFCCC secretary. And I saw uh, there was just one woman there, Christiana Figueres, amidst all the global leaders. And I came back and I wrote about it. And I said, where are the women? When we are talking about decisions that will affect the entire global economy and the entire world, half, excluding half of that population in that decision making is hampering us and is uh, excluding us from all the voices that are going to be affected by, by the climate crisis. So I wrote about it and I said, well, over the next couple of years, there will be opportunities to drive more changes. Well, seven years later in Glasgow at COP26, when I was there, it was the same. The picture was the same, of course, replaced by new leaders, but again, severely lacking in representation for women. So the point I need to make is that it's incredibly important for us to ensure that the population of the world that will in, in many ways be more disproportionately impacted by climate change needs to be included, whether it's in policy making, whether it's in government, whether it's in the private sector. And I think that's something that we still have a long way to go on. There is progress to be, is being made, but there's still a long way to go, as, as I saw from my own experiences. Coming to the point of the private sector, I think there is a tremendous amount of momentum and growth that we're seeing, and the recognition that the transition needs to, be, uh, needs to take place in a way that is just and inclusive of all communities. And the private sector is increasingly and importantly well positioned to drive that because the private sector has the resources and the ability to really drive uh, capital to some of those projects. So I'll give you an example. There has been almost a five-fold rise in the appointment of chief sustainability officers in the S&P 500 companies all over the world. 60% um, of those chief sustainability officers are women. They are responsible for driving lots and lots of changes across supply chains which extend to various different parts of the world, impact a lot of people sitting here in ways that you don't imagine, and also across different stakeholders for uh, you know, companies that are across the tech industry or automobiles or manufacturing or electrical engineering or all sorts of companies across the world. So ensuring that we have the right set of support within the private sector to ensure that leaders who are, or women who are not just chief sustainability officers, but across boards, across management is increasingly important. And according to recent research done by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, greater diversity, both in terms of uh, the, the management and as well as the board diversity has been linked to better climate outcomes, has been linked to better outcomes in terms of environmental policy, in terms of the environmental strategies of that particular company. And I think we need to improve that even more, not just in terms of gender diversity, but also in terms of diversity, including more uh, young voices, including more uh, voices from people from different parts of the world, because climate leadership does not necessarily be need to measured in terms of years of experience, but in terms of the kind of impact that you can drive both at the individual level, at the company level, and even at the national level. And, and I think we, we cannot achieve that without achieving diversity across all those different uh, parts of the, uh, the economy. The third thing that I'll quickly mention, given my experience in, in climate finance and, and helping to mobilize billions of dollars for this transition, is consider this. Climate is, at its core, a behavior-driven problem. It's, it needs to be changed in terms of the consumer demand, in terms of consumer resources, in terms of your choices as consumers, your purchasing power, your spending. But guess what? Who controls two-thirds of global household spending? 
women. Women can, are responsible for 40% of global wealth and drive two thirds of global household pur purchasing decisions. So if women are driving all those decisions that are underpinning this transition to a green economy, and if women are not being included in the designing of the products for that green economy, guess who's not going to buy them? Women. So I think it's incredibly important that we take into consideration this economic and financial rationale because we want to make sure that we're, that we're creating this green economy not for some person on another planet, but for people who live here want to make it habitable. So I'll leave you with these three things. I think it's incredibly um, you know, an exciting time, and I would urge everyone to, to make it their own personal you know, uh, um, a motto to, to include as many people as possible in this journey um, and, and really sort of use the levers that you have if you're in the private sector or in the public sector or in you know, NGO or academia and combine those experiences to, to bring all stakeholders along in this just transition. So thank you so much again for having me. Thank you, Rhythmas. Well said. And I know we're running short of time, but Professor Pratik Sharma, uh, thank you for joining us. And um, Pratik is presently working with Terry School of Advanced Studies as professor and has served as dean academic in the past. He's more, he has more than 20 years of research teaching experience. He received his PhD degree in environmental engineering from an institute of uh, technology, Delhi. He has a master's degree in hydraulics and flood control. I could go on, Pratik, but I, I do want to give you the opportunity to, to really be able to share your views with us. And I'm also so excited to have young girls sitting with us, and I'm looking forward to the next session and hear what you have to tell us. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Dipali. It's uh, such a pleasure and privilege to be part of such a distinguished panel. And wishfully and hopefully, I'm seeing the future. And this should be the character of the boardroom in times to come. And it could have happened <laughs> only by an organization like Terry being led by a lady. And this wonderful event being organized by a lady only, WSDS. Uh, but uh, the fact, I mean, the present reality is not so green. I mean, I'll just, uh, you know, uh, the moment, you know, uh, you see such a panel being part of the boardroom, it brings a lot of discipline, a lot of sanity, a lot of formality. And that is exactly what is required for any business to run smoothly and properly. Uh, as I mentioned, but the present state is not so uh, green. Uh, a simple, some data I'll just share with you. Uh, 500 largest companies in the world, only 11% representation of, is of women. And uh, based on certain statistics, and 37% is all male. Uh, which basically ha also indicates that the dominant male group tends to create false sense of comfort and agreement. And as a result of which the voice which the esteemed panelists have been speaking about gets unheard. Uh, but then there is a good news also. There is a substantial evidence that gender diversity at the management level enhances companies' performance. And if you see sustainability, there are three P's of sustainability, planet, people, and third is profit. Uh, if we are able to provide evidence by doing, collecting primary data and showing that the supply chain, if we follow the sustainable supply chain, it certainly would result in profitability. Then we have done our part as an academician and academicians and researchers. Uh, it's all about profitability. And again, I'll uh, quote from an uh, international labor organization report, which basically indicates uh, recent studies that have been conducted uh, and the sample that, have, that was taken for uh, uh, across 13,000 13, enterprises covering 70 countries in which uh, you know the data reveals that 57 percent respondents basically agreed that the diversity initiatives improved business uh, outcomes and 75 percent of these uh, companies actually 
link gender diversity in their management to profit increase. And it is just not limited to this only. 57% said it was easier to attract better talent when we have more representation of women at the board, on the board. Uh, again, another report indicates that, you know, when you have senior leaders uh, at the leadership position, uh, it creates less gender discrimination, recruitment, promotion, and retention. Uh, which all indicates basically what all you need to have is basically have more representation at various levels. And when we see the global south and global north, I mean the manner in which the representation of women is there, there is a huge difference in which uh, the, 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 the representation exists. Uh, I'll just, I'll, uh, you know, I won't be because of the time paucity, I had prepared something very long, but Vadipali has already given me the cue that I need to be short and brief, and that is exactly what I'm trying to do. Uh, so I'll just skip certain things. Uh, so certainly, apart from, you know, the empathy, understanding, and other things that basically people have tried to find out why, you know, these profitability of these organizations have been increasing amongst, you know, other factors. And uh, uh, certain studies have been done, uh, done by uh, uh, School of Medicine, Pennsylvania, in which, you know, we generally we talk about complementarity between males and females. Uh, the manner in which the our brain is organized, it also indicates complementarity in terms of, uh, you know, the how the brain is wired. And so to say, you know, the uh, to sum it up, I'm, I won't go into the details of this, to indicate this, the, the male part, the male uh, are basically, you know, could be wired to take actions and generally women may tend to be better suited to carefully analyze the problem. And in a leadership role, what all you need is basically a better understanding and empathetic understanding of the problem. And once you have identified, analyzed the problem probably, uh, so obviously you have the answer with you. The solution is available with you. And uh, the careful analysis of problem is the most important thing that any leader uh, uh, would like to have a trait in, uh, you know, in him or herself. Her. So what basically, so just to, I'll just conclude on this short note only. So what, what needs to be done? What can we do? People, you know, uh, talk of representation, talk of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the women not getting opportunities and other things. But the best, most potent tool to empower women is actually education. And through education only, you know, we can actually mainstream women in the, uh, in the uh, uh, mainstream, uh, the women in the uh, uh, policy decision making. And once the women are there in the policy decision making, obviously everything will fall in place. We have a classic example of the chief scientific officer being a woman, which again speaks of, uh, you know, what exactly I'm trying to convey. It's not just by being a woman that she was there. It was just by sheer merit and the, the competence and the education that she brings on the table, she was there. And as a result of which, the same thing that we need to do, if we see the dropout rate, especially in the global south and in the rural parts of most of the developing countries, you find maximum dropout rate is amongst the women, uh, the girl child only. And this is where basically, uh, uh, if we actually tr try to bring these uh, part of the population in the in the in the in imparting education and thereby empower, empowering them that is the only way forward which i feel as an academician something a society can do so i'll stop at that note thank you so much Thank you so much, Pratik, and of course, thank you to the audience for joining us today. I hope we've been able to inspire you to at least make some changes, whatever small or big, you know, in your own day-to-day uh, -day life, because I think climate change is, is not knocking at our door, it's right here. So we need collective action, we need to collaborate more effectively, and yes, let's keep women at the center of everything that we're trying to design. So thank you so much. Thank you to, the, uh, to everybody here on the panel. On behalf of Terry and the WSDS Secretariat, we thank all the distinguished speakers for an insightful discussion and everyone who joined today's session. 
For our online participants, please stay tu uh, tuned and we, uh, we would request all delegates to remain seated for the next session. The next session is on collective action and intergenerational equity for our common future. Thank you.